Which one? Anyway, I can't tell. Those. That looks like a finishing nail for. Sessions, two subcommittee ses uh, sessions, um, in which once again people were were respectful, um, listened carefully, made every attempt to make accommodations to concerns that were raised, and I hope that our executive session will be conducted in the same vein um, that we will continue that respectful tone. Um, that we will not use this as an opportunity for grandstanding and that we will uh, proceed to discuss the two amendments that are going to be brought forward on this bill. So with that, um, we uh, are opening the executive session on Senate Bill 337 and the bill is open to amendment. I have a uh, Representative Casey. I would like to move um, amendment 2008. 1656H, amendment to 330, 337 FM, and I would like to um, pass the baton over to our chairman, uh, Chairman Rouse, in order to speak to that motion. It is her amendment, and I will pass it out. You can pass the copies around to the committee. Yes. Right. <coughs> and is there a second to that? <coughs> Moved by Representative Casey, seconded by Representative Barbara Shaw. And as soon as we have the amendment in hand, I would be happy to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Because the adjustments that were made yeah, that in the was, original bill were adjustments that were made to accommodate <coughs> concerns that we heard raised in both the hearings and in the work sessions. It keeps the notification requirements, but instead of uh, having language that says that someone commencing a homeschool program must notify upon commencement, 
it gives a leeway of five <coughs> business days of commencing the program. People in the homeschool community had concerns that um, in emergency situations, they might not have had the chance to make the decision prior to commencing the program. And they wanted that option for situations that they considered um, urgent for their children. On the other hand, uh, if it were the 30 days that it had been, it, the, the truancy law kicks in after 20 half days of absence. And this left too much leeway for there to be a kind of limbo where we didn't know whether students were in a homeschool program or in truant, or truant, and even worse, for students who were truant to use the uh, notion that they were homeschooling as an excuse, and as, as a shield to hide behind. Section B under Roman 1 um, changed the original law, which, or the original bill rather, which talked about um, having to notify each year on the anniversary date of commencing the program, which people I think rightly pointed out would be a bureaucratic nightmare, and it simply simplifies it so that um, Either the commissioner of education, the resident superintendent, or the principal of a non-public school, and those are the three agencies that in current law have jurisdiction, um, are the, the person the homeschooler reports to. And that they would be notified by the first day, uh, first school, school day of the calendar year. So that simplifies what language that was in the original bill. Um, Roman 5A keeps the requirement for a plan to be submitted, which was in the original bill. And this is the main part, I think, of this bill, which will differ from the second amendment that, that may or may not be introduced, depending on what happens to this amendment. Um, and we've had lengthy discussions about the pros and cons of this plan. I think that, um, as I have said in the past, that I think the exercise of developing a plan is a useful one for parents beginning a homeschool program. It makes them aware of the standards that they are meeting, of the grade level expectations, of the curriculum materials and resources in the community that are available. It may link them up to the networks in the homeschool community. It may result in a conversation with um, their school district. Um, and as a result of conversation in the, um, in the subcommittee meetings, in, in the work sessions, we added an option that instead of a written plan, parents might choose to have a conversation with one of the three supervising agents, the commissioner, the superintendent, or the principal of the non-public school. We also, to clarify, since there were questions raised about this in letter three, uh, letter C, rather, on page two, we were specific that it would apply only to the first child in a family who participates. And we also, in Roman six, said that the parents should be afforded as much possibility as possible in the implementation of the home, home education program under this chapter, so that there would be, should be no question um, with local districts about whether the plan submitted had to be rigidly adhered to. I, for those of you who participated in work sessions, you'll see that I simplified some of the language around this that had talked about um, parents, uh, families, or programs that were <coughs> in a probationary year having to submit plans. So I figured since there was confusion about language, there's already a probationary <coughs> period in place in statute, and maybe that would suffice. Let's see what else we have. <coughs> um, yes, so again, the, the question was raised frequently about whether there was approval or rejection of the plan. Roman 7 makes it clear that there is no role for approval or rejection. Um, and the rest of the bill incorporates language that Representative Carson has brought forward and suggested, including adding members from the legislature to the Home Education Advisory Council and creating a study commission which would review um, the homeschool statute. And under <coughs> these, Page 3, <coughs> lines 28 and 29. 
The Commission shall examine New Hampshire's home education statutes and make recommendations based on its findings for possible future legislation. So, uh, we also, in reviewing the list of members on this study committee, realized that the Department of Ed had been left off and we added that. So questions and discussion from the committee. Representative McCray. Thank you. This is just a very technical question, and maybe you could explain to me on page two, line, uh, well, you'd have to read 25 and 26. Two members nominated by the commi commissioner of the Department of Education or designee. To what does designee refer to? Either the commissioner is going to make the nomination or not. Or are you saying to the commissioner he can designate somebody to make the nomination? So actually that word should be eliminated, the word designate. Well, it's possible that that's intentional. In other words, maybe the commissioner would feel that the person who had worked most closely with the Home Education Council was the person appropriate but, to make the nomination. But that that's still the commission. <coughs> and you'd have to re <coughs> redo that se sentence because if the recommendation is made to the commissioner to make the nomination, you're not, he can make two members nominated. He can call up whoever he wants and says, say, yeah, who should be on it? The, the desig usually the designee is when the commissioner is on the board. Yeah. I, you say I, commissioner of ed education or designee. I mean that's a real big thing, but it's not clear. I see your point. What I would suggest, rather than um, you know bring us back for another executive session, is that whatever depending on what happens to this bill, if we go to committee of conference. And that's something that could be cleaned up there. Representative Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in many of these bills, we have the commissioner or designee, and it often refers to an individual whose job within the Department of Education is to work with specific entities of education, and the designee may be um, the head of the home school program. The commissioner could be one person and a designee could be the head of the home school because the commissioner um, oversees the entire department. And if I were a home school parent, I would certainly want someone as a designee that works with the home school parent and understands what they are doing and what their concerns are. So I don't see anything wrong with designating. You're right, Representative Clark, except normally the language would say the commissioner of the Department of Education or designee. And in this case, it says two members nominated by the commissioner. So I, I think Representative McCray is correct that there's a little contradiction there. <coughs> Representative Stiles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm referring to pages one and two, beginning on line 28 on page one and up to 11 on page two. We're putting them back into the place of presenting a plan, and it's not approved by anyone or anything else, so it's relatively a useless plan that they are submitting. You are giving them the option of discussing with um, the individual that's going to be working with them, but I would think that they would do that discussion anyway because they're going to have to set up the testing. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> testing. So that, that communication is going to take place anyway. I mean, I, I saw no documentation that said that things were any worse off by eliminating that a couple of years ago. And I think it's to the benefit of the, uh, of, of the home school group as a whole because that that allows them to have that communication um, for the testing piece. So I, I, I think that whole section is not necessary. Representative Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
I think if you, um, I'm also going to object to those same provisions of, of the requirement for a plan. Um, in sitting through the two days of te public testimony, it appeared that that was the most egregious part of the bill that the homeschool community objected to. We heard te testimony over and over and over again. Well, if it, it's a plan you want, I can just download something from the internet. It means absolutely nothing. Uh, I agree with Representative Stiles that we did not hear testimony that claimed that something bad was going on, that children were not being educated. Um, I don't see the need for it. Um, there were a couple of comments, um, my goodness, that I have from doing working with the subcommittee, that there's no guarantee that even if you have um, some sort of conversation with the school district, what is really going to be resolved other than the school district or whoever you decide to talk to is going to make a decision about whether or not that parent is competent. Because is that really the object, the object of the plan? Is to see, does the parent know what they're doing? I would like to think that if a parent is going to homeschool, that it would not be a rash decision, that they have, would have talked with the homeschool community to, to make a decision about whether or not that they can do this. And I think that that's one of the one point for me anyway that really came out was that the parents that are engaging in homeschooling their children are very passionate about what they're doing, and they're educating themselves as to the process. They're communicating with each other in a variety of different groups to find ways to better educate their child. So I really question the wisdom of creating any kind of a plan. Um, my goodness, I just have so many questions. Um, one of the things, that, and we, we have, it has not been presented, is the amendment that you all have that I am bringing forward that is basically the same as Representative Rouse's amendment, except it takes out the plan. One of the things that we learned in the subcommittee is that this is an extremely <coughs> complicated issue. I believe <coughs> Representative Dunn called it, uh, equated it to like peeling an onion. The more you get into it, the more you discover that there's there's at play here. And that was one of the reasons why I had created the study committee, uh, to look at our statutes. One theme we heard over and over and over again was this theme about communication. Well, let's start communicating with the homeschool community, and let's hear what they have to say. And they might have a solution, but we don't know because no one really sat down and talked to the homeschool community. I don't want to put something in place, in law, in legislation, that's going to hurt the homeschool community. Let's wait. Let's do our work. Let's get the knowledge that we need in order to make good, rational decisions. And then move forward. I, I just don't see the need to put a plan into place when we don't have the background. We're not familiar with the homeschool statutes. Let's listen to what the homeschoolers have to say about this issue. Bring everybody to the table and resolve the issue that way, rather than impulsively putting something in place. Because somebody might think that something is going on, or kids aren't being homeschooled. I think if you were to look at the data that is available, our homeschool community is doing a terrific job of educating their online children. And I, again, I just don't want to put something in legislation when we really need to study the issue and come up with a plan. Uh, Representative Davidson, followed by Shaw, followed by Clark. Um, I'm sure I'm the person here directing the grand senate, and I have not mentioned the grand senate. <laughs> <laughs> but in any, any, in any case, uh, I want to ask a couple questions on this. Particular bill. I congratulate you for I think it's a good thing for a piece of legislation uh, at this point, at least. Uh, not to say I've read, <laughs> I, I, I'm identified with it, but. On um, the first point, uh, word line 15 at five business days, why didn't you make that seven or nine or something like that, or 10 even, so you talk about 20 half days? Because 10, 10 business days, um, the child is then truant, because truancy is 20 half days. So five business days seem to be an appropriate point. Explain to be 20 half days, guys, that's something I don't like. If a student is absolute, unexcused absence for more than 20 half days, they are considered truant. Okay. So that's 10 days. Or 10 school days. Right, right. 
which would be 10 business days. Right. It'd be true. And so why don't make it eight or something like that? Some other, just a little longer. Why such a short period? That's all I'm asking. I'm asking why the thought of just five, what, is five in precedent somewhere? Is, is there? Then, you know, the whole the only reason to change it was to allow the parent who faced an emergency right. situation to be able to pull their child out and then after the fact say, I'm going to homeschool. Right. Otherwise, you know, what? it seems reasonable to ask a parent to notify prior to commencing their program. So really this was included in order to cover that situation. So why would it need to be more represented? Uh, am I on the floor? You are. <laughs> because, uh, you know, you're actually expecting some, somebody here is actually going to make a decision apparently to homeschool. And <coughs> a few more days might actually be <coughs> some value. Uh, no, I don't. I really thank you for the extra, for the, for the five days. I think it's mm -hmm. proper. I think we should do that. But I wonder if we shouldn't maximize it. So just so, if you, you know, just any number, a little, as much as we can get before we get to 200. Mm -hmm. And just re recall, recall that, you know, the plan piece does have 30 days. Yeah. So, all right. Did you have other questions? Yes, I did. Yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, the word, uh, let's see if I can get the right place here. Oh, in five, uh, 28, it's uh, item, uh, Roman numeral B, A, can you give us a page and a line? I'm sorry, first page? Yep. Yeah, 28. Yeah, line 28. Okay. Line 28. And it's article VA. Yeah. Or whatever. Uh, I was wondering how, uh, under your thoughts here, it doesn't show here, we had a number, what does one person testify about an unschooling approach, which has actually gained a certain amount of mm -hmm. credibility, if not popularity. Uh, how would you envision that given? Uh, Summarizing a plan, and would that pass muster? And they're, you know, when we're talking about uh, you know economics and all this sort of stuff. Would an unschooling plan actually be able to possibly pass muster, or would that would that actually be a red flag plan at that point? In my mind, it certainly would. That I, I think a parent who embraced that philosophy would write something about what that philosophy is and why they were choosing it and how they imagined it might play out with their child. Now, those of us, I, I think you sat in on the work sessions and you know we did look at copies of the rules that used to be in place when this plan had been required up to two years ago. Um, and I think in revisiting the rules, that would be the place to make sure that it did, I mean, the, the rules right now talk about scope and sequence and I think that that would not fit with uh, an unschooling philosophy and the rules would have to allow for that to be one of the options. And you see it? Yes, I do. you see this available in here? I do. And if you don't mind now going in, I or I'll get somebody else before if they want. No, I just want to yeah. ask one more question. That would be uh, six, uh, the line six on page two, uh, and it's article six. The question, the, you know, I get into a question whenever I see legislation about law, legality, and all sorts of things, and heck, this flexibility is possible as possible. I mean, who's making that determination? What are some strengths that create the word possible? Possible in relation to what and so on. Is that a word that's, I'm not sure actually if that's a word that's in legal parlance or something that has a significant meaning. Or I wonder if there is one that we might have used instead. But it feels sort of, oh, well, I have to say, speaking, speaking as a former homeschool parent, the word possible suggests that has a hand somewhere. Maybe uh, it's a, a, maybe it's a you know a heavy hand on the part of the homeschooling parent that they're going to take as much flexibility as they choose. It's well, a possibility for them. Well, no, but this this says a parent shall be afforded. That means somebody else is given the, the flexibility, and that means that they have the right to restrain or hold back that flexibility. So I was wanting to know if there was some rationale that they would be basing that the word. You know, flexibility. Well, what, all I can say is that. Lawyers and legislative services drafted the language, and the instruction to them was that the understanding should be that the plan was a, fe a flexible plan, not one that had to be adhered to strictly. And that's the way they worded it. Thank you. Okay. So um, we were in sequence, Representative uh, Clark, and oh, I think it was you next, Barbara Shaw. I need to start making the list. I just want to say that I. I uh, very much support home education and also of parental rights and constitutional rights and all the rest of that. Having been a teacher for 41 years and a principal also, um, over those 41 years, I 
could not imagine the amount of paper that would be stacked here if I had to show all of the lesson plans, planning, uh, units, everything that I was asked to present in order to do my job. And I do not feel that by asking a concerned parent, and I had a very nice conversation with a woman on the phone the other day, and I know several people who homeschool their children, one of my former students is right up there with hers. Um, and I, I feel that submitting a plan is not, it's something they should be afraid of. Um, and it, it isn't unconstitutional to ask for. I also feel that it is something that is a protection, and that is the one thing that I've always wanted to protect children, and I think it's a protection for the children who are pulled out, and I've seen it, pulled out for 30 days, brought back in for a month, uh, pulled out for a week, brought back in. They're going to be homeschooled, and nothing is ever presented as to what is happening to that child. And I think that that is why I, I support this, and I support your amendment. Thank you. Um, Representative Shaw said partially what I had in mind. I think that with some of the telephone calls that I've received, some of the parents thought that they had to submit a plan <coughs> each year or for each one of their children, and the children <coughs> may be a year or so apart. And I don't think that's really fair. I feel that um, instead of a specific plan, they can present a type of philosophy and an overall um, wording <coughs> of what they would like for their child to learn. In addition, I also feel that if we don't have an individual in the Department of Education that um, is somewhat of a homeschool coordinator or overseer, there should be someone knowledgeable about homeschooling so that if a parent has a question about something, they can call. And when this problem comes up again, if it does, if we get the study committee, someone should be able to say, um, I have visited with or spoken to many of the homeschool parents, and as far as I'm concerned, they're doing this, that, and the other, and everything would fall into place. I don't think it's uh, fair for the parents to feel that every single year they have to present a plan. Because if, even if they present it, they wouldn't have to follow it because they have flexibility in what they do. I listened to hours of testimony on this film. I've agonized about this ever since, as a matter of fact. And I guess I finally remember. If this bill did something for the few uh, kids who are not getting a fair deal for home education, and it is a small number, there are some, but I don't think this bill does anything for these kids. Um, <coughs> the plan, I think everybody should, if every parent should make it. However, uh, it should be meaningful, and I can see where this, there's no judgment of this plan, nothing done with it. So I'm afraid I will have to vote against this amendment. Rep Representative Carson, followed by Representative Hugh. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Um, in regards to um, a comment made by Representative Shaw, is using the plan as a protection to make sure kids are getting educated. I don't believe that to be so because, again, and I refer back to the hours of testimony that I know I sat through where parents said, if you want a plan, I can just go to the internet and download something and give it to you. That it really has to have a meaning and a purpose. 
this legislation does not address that at all, and that's why I put together the study committee so that we can look at how can we do this and, and really get this done so it becomes something that's meaningful, but it's not an impediment for homeschool parents. And, and again, it, it really, I think, feeds into my argument about just putting something into law because we think something needs to be there. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's study this issue and come up with something that everyone can live with. And in regards to the plans themselves, I believe that the legislation is not very clear about who's, who is really submitting a plan and how many times it has to be submitted. Do you just have, say if you're a homeschool parent that has three children and you decide you want a home school, so you pull your children out and you create a, a home school. Now, do you create a plan? You have to create a plan under this amendment for the first child. But now, if you have other children that are going to be going into the program, do you have to resubmit that plan for each child? Or is one plan going to be enough? I, I, I don't really see that as, as being clear. It's clear for the first child. But what about for the second child or the third child? Page two, line four. Page two, line four. The first child. But if your object is to protect that child, then why aren't you requiring that every child afterwards get a plan? You see, I, I just think there's a lot of questions that emerge with this, with this idea around a plan. And I think it's prudent for the committee to take a step back, to study this issue, and to come up with something that we can all work with. And when I say all, I mean the legislature, the Department of Education, and the homeschool community. That's all I'm going to ask with my amendment that I bring forward. I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. We do not have the expertise currently to even begin to answer those questions. Let's not be rash. Let's take our time and let's do the right thing. Representative Jean. Yes. Thank you. I have attended the public hearings. I've had telephone calls, emails, and again, like many of you, I <coughs> have struggled with this idea. And the position that I've taken at this point, my belief is that the home education system is not broken. If it's not broken, I fix it. We vote it against it. Uh, Representative Day, followed by Representative Grimmick. I would like um, to have a plan. However, I would like it to be more defined than this. So I will vote against this plan because I would like the committee, the well, there's the two, the, the group that's, that would go forward um, if we passed either of these amendments um, to consider the type of plan that would be most effective. Um, Representative Grimm. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with the current plan? Is that, are you that? I'm posing that as a yeah. question because as far as I know, I have seen no statistical data to influence me, being a former math teacher. Uh, we have a pile of things that are going wrong, and if so, what are they? Or if not, uh, we're doing okay. That's one I'm kind of a C-SPAN addict, and uh, I often watch uh, quite late at night, and the other night I saw an interesting that's going on with the uh, Supreme Court Justice Kelly. And uh, he was asked the question, well, if you had to choose between a, a law and a tradition, what would you choose? And he said, I come down on the side of the tradition, always, because that has been something that's developed by our culture for, over generations. And the law is something that was just passed maybe on the spur of the moment. I think there's a tradition of homeschooling. Certainly we've all homeschooled our kids up until the age of five. And most of us have done a pretty good job, so I shall vote against it now. Um, I see one more hand. I wonder if, I, I sense that we're winding down, and I wonder if we should alert Representative Price that we're going to go shortly. Uh, Representative Reed. 
Well, I really wasn't going to speak at all. And, uh, I guess the only reason I am is that sort of everybody is weighing in. Um, like most of you, I've struggled with this. Had many phone calls, many emails. In fact, I've been emailing with a homeschooling gentleman in New Jersey, and we struck, struck up by friendship. Um, mainly because his first email was so negative about public school essentially. Um, I emailed back and said, are you trying to persuade or polarize? And uh, then he began emailing and we kept going back and forth. And, and I realized that part of, um, part of what I struggled with is having spent 12, 21 years on the school board, I'm such a strong supporter of public education that I found myself incredibly offended by so many of the emails that I got, so much of the testimony that came before me. And, and yet I, I understand, I mean, when I, in a rational moment as I backed off and, <coughs> and thought about it, I, I realized that the other side was feeling incredibly threatened by what we might do to a system that uh, they've worked very hard at and have been incredibly successful. Um, and that we will certainly, you know, first do no harm if that came, comes to mind. I would like to think, and I, and I know that in my own school district that we've worked over time um, to be as cooperative as we can with the homeschooling community. That we've opened our schools up to physical education if they wanted to access it, to the music and the art programs. Um, and I just think that, that in the best world we can, we can coexist in a way that is helpful to both. Um, I see nothing in the legislation that in my mind <coughs> is going to enhance the capitalism. I have such respect for both entities and so um, I, I, I would have to vote no on this. I wonder if your conclusion matches your really. No, I don't think it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess I'm messing with the law that, you know, and I, well, okay. I could have been simpler and said that it's not a real thing. Don't fix that. All right. So I do. So we, we do have more people who would like to speak. Uh, Representative O'Neill, Representative, um, I mean, it's clear where this is going, so you don't have to drag this out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. I'm against the amendment that is proposed. Uh, reading it over, having been a former superintendent, I don't think we need to put people through this. Uh, there's a lot of, I hate to say, busy work. There's nothing to be done at the end of it. I can't approve a program. I can't reject the program. I'm just going to sit there and listen to 4,000 people that say, talk to me about uh, their, their needs for their children. So, I think it's better to look at another amendment on the committee and uh, let us iron it out over a period of time. So I will vote against mm -hmm. the votes. Are there more comments over here, Representative Shaw? I just went along with everything that Ms. Zebra said, but then when it came to the rationale, I just thought that um, the, the spirit of agreement the spirit of cooperation um, is included in this bill, and, and um, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm totally in favor of homeschooling, and, and I, I, I told one woman, I said I was a teacher, and there was no way I would ever educate my own kids. So, you know, it's just, um, it's just one of those things that we all have our own feelings about, but there's absolutely no hostility or anything. This is my idea that this is um, a coming together and a cooperative effort. All right. So, I, in closing, I would just go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I too have listened and listened and listened, um, and I am on the original bill. I will vote for this particular amendment because I was on the original bill. However, I have a feeling I will be voting in a very distinct minority, at least on the first bill. Thank you.
<laughs> In closing, I thought I would like to share with you an email that another legislator, not on the uh, Education Committee, had sent to um, in response to one of the many emails that he had received. Um, and th this was his response. My personal stance, after urging them to get in touch with us, which of course they have been doing. <laughs> My personal stance on SB 337 is that it attempts to bring accountability to homeschooling programs. With the recent increase in New Hampshire school dropout age, parents and teens who want to leave public schools are pressured to commit to homeschooling as justification for why Billy or Mary no longer attend. Homeschooling becomes a euphemism for sanctioned dropping out. I think this bill seeks to hold parents accountable to their commitments. I don't feel that it unfairly burdens or limits the educational options open to conscientious homeschooling parents like you, whose primary motivation for making such a commitment is to ensure the highest quality education to their children. I thought that was a thoughtful response to someone who had not actually participated in all of our hearings and discussions. And is in part an answer to your question, I think, Representative Bremick. Um, my feeling is that this particular piece of what might be, what might become, or be, go back into statute has been fully vetted, fully exposed to dialogue, has made every attempt to accommodate concerns raised, that this piece will never go through such intense scrutiny again, um, and, and I am also persuaded that this piece will never be acceptable to the homeschool community, that that much has been made clear. So no matter how much dialogue we have, how much we study, I do not think there's going to be movement beyond what has happened in this, which was the reason that I continue to bring it forward. I um, understand and respect your own decisions, and I think that we are ready to vote. So, okay, so the motion on the floor is ought to pass on um, Amendment 1656 to Senate Bill 337. And the clerk will call the roll. Representative Dunn? Yes. Representative Yetton? No. Representative Jean? No. Representative Clark? Yes. Representative Casey? Yes. Representative Barbershaw? Yes. Representative Merrick? Representative Kimberly Shaw? No. Representative Day? No. Representative O'Neill? No. Representative Weaver? No. Representative Carson? No. Representative Ingridson? No. Representative Hess? Representative Remick? No. Representative Stiles? No. Representative McCray? No. Representative Crane? No. Representative Price? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Representative Rouse? Yes. <laughs> 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 So the vote is 5 to 13. The motion fails, and the uh, bill is open to further amendment. Uh, Representative Clark, question? Comment? Um, I have to say to the but I have looked at the amendment that she has. I have to be present to I understand. I understand. I just want to be my yes. comment. You know, if we I, do this yeah. in the next two minutes, we can vote. I believe to. that that's going to be possible. Yeah. Representative Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move Amendment 2008-1658-H. I'd like to make a motion for to pass. Second. Who is uh, the second? Made by Representative Carson, seconded by Representative Price. Okay. Um, just a, a comment. Um, this legislation, this amendment basically does the same thing as Representative Rouse's, except that there is no plan in here. We agreed about uh, the notification piece, and it establishes a study committee to look at our homeschool statutes. And it also puts um, two, I believe, legislative members on the home, uh, homeschool advisory council, and that's all it does. And I mean, I, I don't even have a copy in front of me. Does it add the department to the study yes, committee? Yes, it does. And does it yes. have the same language about duties? Yes. Okay. Same exact thing. Okay. I told Anthony to draft it. That's okay. All right. 
All right, so the motion on the floor is off to pass on Amendment 1658 on Senate Bill 337. And the clerk will call the roll. Representative Dunn? Yes. Representative Yetton? Yes. Representative Jean? Yes. Representative Clark? Yes. yes. Representative, yes. Representative Casey? Yes. Representative Shaw? Yes. Bye. Representative Maris? Representative Kimberly Shaw? No. Yeah. Representative Day? Yes. Representative O'Neill? Yes. Representative Reaver? No. Representative Carson? Yes. Representative Ingridson? I um, I protest. I didn't get a chance to have a conversation here. I, I'm I sorry. I didn't see a hand. I didn't ask. I didn't, I didn't invite. I did sure. not invite discussion. Uh, beg your pardon. No, it's, um, it's okay. I we're in the middle of a vote. Uh, I think I have a platform anymore, but I my vote's no. Uh, at least on my basis. I apologize. I'm trying to accommodate people who have to leave. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Um, Representative Hess, Representative Remick? Yeah. Representative Stiles? Yes. Yeah. Representative McRae? No. Representative Crane? No. Representative Price? Yes. Representative Rouse? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I mean, clearly you, your platform could be in the, in the blurb. So, um, the vote is 13 to 5, and the motion carries. Um, so, uh, yes, I'd like to first, um, that we pass 1337 as amended. Second. Seconded by Representative Casey. 1337 as amended by 16588. Correct. Um, this would be the opportunity. <laughs> is there discussion by the committee? Representative Ingersoll. Thank you. I did, I, I did see another opportunity on that, but I, uh, but I thought it was not appropriate. So, apologies to you. I don't mean to attack the chair. Um, now, I, um, I, again, we're back to that question. I won't uh, make it a long time to talk about it, but it isn't broken. Now we're going to look at this and get fixed. I hear that so, so we in the State House uh, will find all sorts of things to fix. We'll look at it like this. And, uh, and it isn't broke, and we're, it's a solution looking for a problem. It's a, <laughs> so we're gonna, it ain't broke, and we're gonna fix it till it is what it looks like. Right? So I have to say, I have to say, we really should not be doing this. We should go back to a little old principle, and that is the founding era. Abigail Adams in that wonderful movie, teaching her children there, and we had a 90 some percent literacy rate. We have it now. 60% literacy rate or something. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it doesn't portend well for us to get involved in fixing something. It isn't broken. It's doing better than what we're doing. For us to get involved in that, I don't, I just can't follow the logic of it. And uh, I just don't like us with our little fingers in this mess. But, so thank you very much. Uh, Judging on the vote of the last, on the last amendment, I am presuming that this is going to pass. If it, it is diametrically opposed to the original bill that came through. Now, I would like to know what policy we are going to um, have going forward if there's a committee of conference. Are we going to stick just with this, or are we going to compromise and put the original bill back in? We would be... Um we, we would be obligated to yeah. represent the House position, which would be the contents of this amendment. Correct. That, that is correct. However, it has happened in times past that the original bill was also included with the Senate's position was included with the House's position when committees of conference finally that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can come back to the House and not be accepted if that's what happened. I, I think that whoever is appointed from this committee to represent the House position would be firm. And I, I can, if it happens to be me, I can promise you that I would represent the House position firmly. Thank you. 
uh, represented yet. In response to the fact that some people have said if it isn't broken, uh, just won't fix it. Uh, Perhaps it isn't broken, perhaps it's been in a few places, and perhaps the committee can uh, make it better. Representative Jean. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is a bill that is looking for a problem that doesn't exist. Therefore, I'm going to vote against it. Representative Carson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, mean, I look at this as, as rather than looking for problems as an opportunity for us as legislators to really become educated about homeschool. Um, I cannot say that I'm familiar with homeschool statutes and what's going on out there in the homeschool community because we've never had the ability to talk to each other other than through someone sending you an email or, or a phone call. So as a legislator, I would like to know Okay, how, how does this work? Um, what's going on in other places around the country? Perhaps some of, we're requiring more of our homeschool community than other states are across the country. We don't know that because we've never really taken the opportunity to look. I'm not looking under the rug and I'm looking for a problem. I just want to learn more about the homeschool community and what's happening. And there might be something that they can suggest to us as legislators. There's something that they need. But we don't know that because we haven't been able to really communicate with each other. So that's the only purpose, my purpose, in bringing this forward. Representative Dunn. Well, my comments are related to what you just said. Several times during the work session, uh, we heard from the homeschooling community that it would be nice to have a conversation. Uh, because right now, there really isn't one. Um, and so for that very reason, I think it's important that we set up a vehicle where a conversation between all of those parties who are interested get to, if a problem is discovered, all of the parties who are interested get a voice. And I think that's important, I really do. Uh, Representative Ingerson, followed by Representative Reaver. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, in response to that, uh, Representative Dunn, uh, we have the HVAC, and uh, we understand in conversations, I've had very deep conversations with members, that the DOE has essentially sort of pushed them aside and had a very difficult time communicating with them, but yet they are established by us for that very purpose. Mm -hmm. I wonder why we wouldn't just simply, for example, follow up with what the second half, for example, or the Representative Ross's bill, which they clearly approved us of just adding those members of the House to the HVAC and continuing and make a much simpler problem. They're not to erase it, what would otherwise be a problem. I mean, we are so much there already with the HVAC. Why, why not, or H, S, whatever it's called. <laughs> the, uh, council, uh, the Council Council. I guess I can leave it at that one. Okay, I, I don't disagree with that. I think part of the problem I mean, I shouldn't be answering that question. Uh, I'll talk about it. <laughs> um, I am concerned with the piece that you read just before we took the vote about the, having raised the age uh, to be to 18 as opposed to 16. And that that is perceived to be a possibility of kind of a loophole that the kids who want to walk away will use. And I, and I don't. I don't want to use homeschooling to, to correct that problem, but there's got to be something done, and I, I don't know where that concern goes. But I think it might be real. Thank you. Seems to me, if I remember correctly, <clears throat> that's the fine print in SB 18 saying that it didn't apply to home. But to pull a 16 year old out, for it. <coughs> to pull a 16 year out year old out under the pretext of pretext that they're going to be homeschooled because the student is fresh with the parent. That that was what I was picking up. Um, that it's sort of another way of skidding the cat. They get to the school. Um, no real homeschooling is being done. By the time it's picked up on, perhaps. But that same argument 
that it says you go to the, the principal and come up with a plan with the principal. This, you could make the same argument that the student can go to the principal and say, I'm taking online courses and never do anything. So, I mean, I think when you talk about that age group, 16 to 18, we're going to have a whole boatload of problems, not, not home, I, over and above homeschooling problems. I think we should leave them out of the mix and just talk about the, the little ones, because that 16 to 18 is, I think, going to be problematic for, for superintendents and principals and school boards and everybody else going forward. No, no, I, I, I think they discussion. Representative Hess. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize in advance for this question because I was chairing a uh, uh, uh Can somebody tell me in two sentences why we need subparagraph Roman 1B, 16 through 19 on the first page? Is that designed to cure a problem that currently exists? Is the reference uh, 16 through 19 on page 1. The notification. Yeah, to continue. I, I understand there's a difference between commencing a program and continuing a program, but I'm not sure what the distinction is. I, I think the Department of Education has a concern about just knowing where students are. And a follow-up question? Yes. So, DOE doesn't feel that the current statutory language requires a homeschooling parent to notify the department every year they decide to continue homeschooling? I think that's correct. <coughs> In response to that, wasn't it also to identify a date so that it wasn't the anniversary of the thing it consolidated so that we could have the beginning of the school year? Yeah, continued notification so it puts everyone on the same page rather than April 15th, or November 16th, or, uh, if you're going to continue to be notified, it's The current statute, as I look quickly to refresh my memory, does not refer to notification of continuing the program. Yes. Any further discussion? <laughs> um, so the, I think the one thing I would add um, to what's been said is that the homeschool community themselves have said to the extent that there are problems that might come up, it reflects badly on their entire program and that they would like to participate in addressing those problems. And I think that um, this study and the participation of legislators on the advisory council should be able to facilitate some joint problem solving. Further discussion? I'm just wondering, you know, I'm just wondering if the uh, advisory council wouldn't have been something to be what, shut down or something. Or would it, would it be a this is short-lived. Representative Carson. Thank you. Um, if you see Representative Ingridson, this is a very short um, study committee. They have to report before November 1st of this year. So we're not talking about something that's long and, and drawn out. But the other part that, that I feel is very, very important is that we put legislators on the Homeschool Advisory Committee. Um, they weren't there before, and, and I agree, I heard from many parents, uh, homeschoolers, that they would, go, they would go to this meeting and the other members uh, weren't there. Um, and, and I'm not talking about the homeschool community, I'm talking about some of the other uh, statutory members. So I think this is a good vehicle for us to begin a dialogue. Um, and that's all I wanted to do, was just to create a vehicle to create a dialogue. Uh, two things. One, um, I, I never believed this was a good bill. Oh, great, I'm so sorry. That's OK. It happens all the time. <laughs> she apologized to her. <laughs> that don't look too good today, I pretty sad. Um, <clears throat> I, I just want to say that I, I've never thought this was a good idea. I never thought this was a good bill, and primarily because there is no problem that needs to be fixed, and we did not see any evidence that there was a problem. If we saw massive truancy, I might uh, consider this, but I don't even think we need a, a committee. I would like to ask that we please vote on this because I have three minutes, and I have to leave. <laughs> I'm very, very sick today. Um, so could we move the question? So the motion on the floor is what to pass uh, amendment. Thank you. Uh, amendment 465. Oh, the bill itself. The bill itself. Yeah, on SB 
57 as amended by um, 1658. And the clerk will call the roll. Representative Dunn? Yes. Representative Yen? Yes. Representative Jean? No. Representative Clark? Representative Casey? Yes. Representative Barbershaw? Yes. Representative Merrick? Representative Kimberly Shaw? No. Representative Day? Yes. Representative O'Neill? Yes. Representative Reaver? No. Representative Carson? Yes. Representative Ingridson? No. Representative Hess? No. Representative Remick? No. Repre Representative Stiles? Yes. Representative McCray? No. Representative Crane? No. Representative Price? Oh. Representative Rouse? Yes. <coughs> So the vote is 9 to 8, and the motion carries. Um, <coughs> Representative <coughs> and do we have someone stepping forward to do the minority report? <coughs> All right, we have um, one more bill, but I think that we will just recess for a minute to let the um, gallery clear out. No, I assume they do. Um, thank you again for attending, and thank you for your help along the way to develop Yes, only this version goes to the floor, um, and it'll be voted on next week. And the vote of 98 doesn't send a very strong signal to the rest well, of the Well, show, it'll show that, that it's a divided issue, that there really wasn't a consensus. So, and if the, and if the House decides they want to vote no, then right. they can kill it on the floor of the House, too. Do you have any sense for that I have yet? no idea. Um, it was a very, as you can see, a very divisive issue, and what I tried to do was craft something that the Democrats would vote rather than voting for him. Right. The Ross Amendment, yeah. which I think would have been very destructive. So this way, it gave them an opportunity to vote for something, and some of the Republicans would go along with it. But if you kill it on the floor, I, I have no problems with that. But I do think, but I, but I think though, there really needs to be people on the Home Advisory Council, legislators, so we can talk with you, so we know what's going on in the, in the community. And if there are problems, not only from our side, but from your side, there's a way for us to talk to each other, other than someone putting in a bill and then all of a sudden you're reacting. And you didn't get a, ch a chance to be a part of the process. <coughs> and that's what I'm really concerned about, is that the homeschool people were not part of this process. You just came in and you reacted to what you saw was being done. And I don't want that to happen that's, again. That's not going to stop them in the future from bringing no. bad bills. No, it will, but it'll the get unions you. Unions and the school boards will always right. do that. But you will have legislators that are going to be familiar with the homeschool process who will be able to stand up knowledgeably and defend what's going on in the homeschool community. I can't do that now because I have no idea. I mean, and I think that really came out during the subcommittee and Representative um, Dunn kept saying, this is like peeling an onion. The more you, you open it up, there's more there and that we don't know about. So I think it's a good opportunity for the legislature, or members of the legislature, to educate themselves about the homeschool process, what's going on in the community. I prefer Did you add people to existing advisory councils? Yes, yes, the homeschool advisory reps. council is already in place. You want to add two reps and a senator? Yes, yes, so that way we can talk to each other. Pardon? How does that change the voting in Michigan? For on the for what the study committee or? Oh, I just want to say that um, there's no reason that legislators couldn't come visit the council. Right. I'm sure we are glad to give you an opportunity to speak if there's anything you want to say. Right. So I agree. Even if whether the bill passes or not, there's a chance for dialogue. Well, right. again, one of my concerns, sure, and it sure. was listening, was that there was a real lack of communication. 
It's true. So this is a way that we usually do when we communicate is we put legislators on a council or on any type of committee. That way there is a, a recognized meal for discussion. We especially saw during the debate of Senate Bill 16 and later Senate Bill 18 when people were making statements about home education that didn't reflect reality at all. And, and yes, we were just a minor yeah. part of the discussion. Right. And so people were saying things like home schools are exempt, but we knew that the language didn't accomplish that. Right, right. So and see, that would have been a great opportunity to have that discussion, but, but you're, you're, so but you're reacting. But the problem is, is you are reacting. You are not being part of the process when we're sitting down and crafting this legislation or to talk and say, I know, I know. It, it, it would give you an opportunity so in November when they start drafting these bills the legislators can come and say okay here's a couple of bills that I think you people should be aware of we need to sit down and talk is this going to affect homeschooling if it's not okay that's fine we're not going to deal with that but there has to be a way to communicate and that's all I really wanted to do was to communicate so that was the purpose of it so if it gets killed on the floor of the house that's fine with me too but I wanted to craft something other than the House of which I yeah, believe would have passed. I think that it would have passed. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like I spent a lot of time on the phone this weekend. Is it like <laughs> anything would be presented on the floor of the house? Um, it could. Yeah. They could. But at this point, I don't think so. I mean, it's hard to say I don't know if Representative Rouse would. The thing is, is when it gets to the Committee of Conference, and that was a question that Representative McRae brought forward, was are you going to uphold our position? And if she is on that, um, I don't think she, well, no, she voted yes. So um, hopefully we'll get legislators on there that are going to uphold the House position. If not, we can make hay on the floor. Are those committee meetings open to the Yes. Yes, so all committee of conference, everything we do is, is open to the public. So um, I don't believe you will be able to speak during the committee of conference, but you can sit and watch and, and watch what's going on. So, yes, but please uh, watch the calendar um, as to when it's going to be scheduled. I'm hoping to get on that committee of conference. I'll ask the uh, committee chair. Okay. So um, what should I say? Hopefully that'll work. Okay. But please, if anybody has any questions, just email me. Just don't. Don't hesitate. Um, I don't know, people were saying they were getting nasty letters from, nasty emails. I didn't get any nasty emails. I didn't get any nasty emails. I didn't get any nasty emails. I didn't They're not nearly as from. nasty as the legislation these people pass every yes. couple of years. The exact words in the committee meetings were made available through audio and video recordings. And I think that was happening was there was a reaction to those specific comments. And I don't like the language. Oh, okay. what you say. There wasn't the dialogue about what they, what they really meant. People right. often heard them and reacted. Heated, heated specific emails. Yeah, but, have yeah, I, but I didn't even get those. I mean, I, I just had very respectful emails saying, you know, this is why you should kill the bill. But uh, my concern was if if I didn't bring something forward that was a compromise, it would have passed. I'm concerned. I don't. You know, I want to thank all of you for bringing your children. I think this is a great opportunity for kids to see how our government actually works. It is. Rather than just reading about it in a textbook. Yeah, and it's probably fair.